I woke up in the middle of the night one night this week. Let's see how many other people had that experience. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like a given now, isn't it? But I woke up uh, fretting over the task of writing, composing this sermon. It's persistently humbling in these difficult times to write a message worthy of and truly pertinent to the times we're living in. Perhaps it's something lacking in my own faith, but I have never found it possible to simply preach the good news of the gospel. To me, the gospel message has never been simple, just as human life is never simple. All too often, the gospel has been misappropriated for, for personal aims and taken at what is sometimes belligerently declared as face value. To me, both the Hebrew writings and the gospel message hold profound eternal mysteries that ask each human soul in each generation to conscientiously and creatively tease forth its, its mystery into newness of life. Each time I sit down to write a sermon, I ask myself what I'm being called to do today. I wrestle with whether I'm being asked to unpack the historical and literary background of the scripture text, to pinpoint its most essential message as I see it, to address the profound suffering and important social turmoil of our time, to be sensitive to the individual, emotional, and physical struggles of this particular congregation, to be honest, yet hopeful, challenging, yet comforting, to speak of universal realities and yet connect intimately to the lived reality in the heart of each one of you. Well, for some reason, and it's so quirky that I had to include it, for some reason at four in the morning, I began ruminating on my early lessons in English grammar. First, second, and third person, singular and plural present tense. Singular, I go, you go, he, she, it goes. Plural, we go, you go, they go. I really did this. I thought about how the subject in the second person, the one directly addressing another person, you, doesn't change when you goes from singular to plural. Each of you go and all of you go. You as a subject is both singular and plural, individual and collective. As an object, this is also true. It's not me or us or him, her, it or them, but simply you. So when I speak to you this morning, it is built right into the language that this will be necessarily ambiguous to everyone. Is my message to each of you or to all of you? Is, import, is it important to you personally or are you being invited into a collective awareness? The answer must of course be both and the possibility of my doing this adequately will be almost nil. Each of us have had experiences this week, or for that matter, throughout our entire lives, which have brought us uniquely to this moment in time with our different needs and hopes, perceptions and purposes, hurts and losses, triumphs, interests, passions, wounds, and gifts. The words of anything I or you might speak, there goes that ambiguous you again, are heard differently by everyone. We know this is the case in our own lives, so it makes sense that it would certainly also be true of the words of the scripture, of Hebrew prophets, of Jesus, of the followers of Jesus, as writers of the sacred texts. This makes the words no less true. It just reminds us that their work is never finished, never complete. It is never done and it cannot finally ever be done for us. It is our task, our daring task, to study these words, to ponder them, to turn to resources of ones wiser than ourselves, to pray for discernment, to discuss their meaning with others, 
to be skeptical about those who insist on easy answers and to allow the spirit that abides in the prophecies and parables to come to us freshly new and alive at different circumstances and different times in our lives. When Jesus sent out the first 12 disciples, he gave them instructions with curious detail about what to do, how to speak, when to walk away, what to trust, what not to fear. He said, see, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues and you will be dragged before governors and kings. I invite you when you get a chance to read the whole chapter, chapter 10 of Matthew. It's densely packed and not effortlessly understood. Let it speak to you as if you're hearing it for the first time. Jesus is warning his disciples of what will occur in their future ministry, preparing them for the arduous journey of disillusionment and abuse, of insecurity and hesitancy of speech. And he doesn't sugarcoat his warnings at all. For some reason, despite the painful prognosis of what is ahead, his disciples still stick around. But what else is being said? I found in my years of writing sermons, even ones on the same passage, you know, the lectionary's three-year cycle, we come back around, we come back around to different scriptures. But even so, each time a new focus emerges, a new message is formed, a new understanding shines into life. Jesus asks those he had chosen to carry his message in the world not to lead with fear. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not be made known. Fear paralyzes us. It blinds us. It saps our spirit. Finally, it can brutalize us and make brutes out of us, as we see in racism or nationalism. In this trying time, I'm aware of how much fear many of us live in a great deal of the time. With COVID-19's lethal contagiousness, caution is warranted. Disciplined carefulness is necessary. But being twisted into knots with fear cripples our humanity, aborts real creativity, makes loving and compassion, compassionate action possible, impossible, excuse me. I have also, however, been humbled by the courage of so many to keep on keeping on with their work. Their work as healthcare providers, caregivers in nursing homes, and I'm very, very pleased with the ones that are in my own mother's nursing home, the dear capacity for compassion in those people to keep on keeping on as the essential workers do, holding our social structure together with sometimes simple, sometimes intricate tasks. I've been in awe of the young and not so young that have taken to the streets, black and white, exposing themselves to risk of disease and of violence because they, as a body of humanity, believe in something bigger than their own immediate safety. For the people of color, giving up is not an option. They are fighting for their lives and the lives of their children, the next generation. They're speaking out for the honor of their ancestors who were beaten down in body and spirit, many who were enslaved. Jesus said, what I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But back to you as both singular and plural. Now the world, as many of us have known it, is falling apart. Profound changes are happening and will continue to happen around us, within us. Our image of being contained, self-contained, self-sufficient, self-made individuals is breaking apart. 
We, a relatively very few, have lived privileged lives, living under the assumption that we are entitled to all we have, the shelter, the food, the education, the medical care, the sense of relative safety as we go about our daily lives. Many of us are grateful, surely grateful to God, and we give prayerful thanks. But too few of us realize that it is really not okay to separate ourselves entirely from the dark underbelly of injustice, racism, and poverty so that so many in this world live in. We have held up rugged individualism as an ideal, and that ideal is now crumbling and exposing its greed and bigotry. Our pluralistic culture cannot contain it. The central Christian message doesn't allow it. Christ's life and his words proclaim that we are one body in the spirit. How is it that we can take our individual body with its wonderful and unique experiences and expressions, a body that gives us the ability to taste and smell and touch, that experiences its own personal pain and longing and pleasure and aspirations. How is it that we can live in both this body, this individual body, as well as in the one body of the spirit? What does it mean for life as we know it to take seriously and viscerally and faithfully the call to be one body in spirit, in awareness, in compassion, in service to each other? Juneteenth was the day, a full two and a half years after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, when Union Army General Gordon Granger and his men rode into Galveston, Texas and announced two and a half years later that the Civil War was over and all slaves were freed. I thank everyone who came out to ring the bell, especially our youth, for racial justice. Our denomination, the United Church of Christ, held a webinar this week to commemorate Juneteenth, entitled, And Still We Rise. On this webinar, many African-American clergy and leaders spoke, and their messages were eloquent and moving. A recording of a sermon by Dr. Reverend Otis Moss of Trinity UCC in Chicago, given the Sunday after the killing of George Floyd, passionately spoke to a line from a familiar protest song, We Shall Overcome. Remember the line, We Shall Overcome Someday and sometimes on tune. Someday, Otis asked, when is someday? When will it take us, what will it take from us from the someday of justice to arrive? When for God's sake will someday be today? But probably the piece that was the most powerful for me, that affected me the most, was a display of a collection of old postcards, each with a picture of a lynching of a black man, woman, or child. In many, the white crowd stood around smug and sure of their place, gazing on the lifeless corpse hanging from a tree or bridge, almost like dogs after a hunt. It was haunting to look at these, the suffering and the cruelty. But it felt important on this day. It filled my heart with a courage, the kind of courage that comes, albeit momentarily, from deep pain and compassion. The pain that is being taken to the streets by our black brothers and sisters is today real and it is personal. It is centuries old, passed down from generation to generation in their very bones. Many of the marchers are called by their faith to resist injustice and insist on social change. Their lives matter to God. How do those who have lived as an underclass facing the social limitations that racism has put on their lives in housing and education 
and job opportunity and medical care and equal and unequal justice before the law, hear the words of Jesus when he says to all of us, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Your father, the hairs of your head, you are of value. Marching together on the streets, singing and chanting and speaking out their resistance to the cruelty of white supremacy, standing up for liberation, insisting on change of the status quo, they must hear the life-giving power of Jesus' words. You are both intimately as individual souls and collectively as people of color worthy of God's love. So resistance should not be a scary or undesirable word to any of us, for that which is good must resist evil. The psalmist offers a prayer for the suffering of this time in our own, which we heard Mark read today. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. In the words he said at the beginning to open our worship, Christ came to make all things new, that the kingdom might come, that the world might believe, that the powerful might stumble, that the humble might be raised up. Christ came in loving spirit. Christ came to make all things new. When we open ourselves to the newness of Christ's spirit, someday must be today. Thanks.